E.T. The story of platinum is as old as history. The earliest known use of the material dates back to the 7th century before Christ. It's probable that the craftsmen who fashioned the caskets found at Thebes thought they were working with a particularly intractable piece of silver. The first written record in our era didn't appear until the 16th century, when Spain discovered and conquered the New World. Although the Indian inhabitants had been using it in their jewellery for more than a thousand years. The conquistadors came across a strange white material in the gold deposits of the Choco district of New Granada, now Colombia. In their ignorance, they called it platina, which means little silver. And that is how platinum got its name. With the development of chemistry in the middle of the 18th century, the new metal began to attract the attention of scientists. In 1751, the Swedish assayer, Scheffer, recognized platinum as a totally new element. And in 1803, the sister platinum group metals, palladium, rhodium and iridium, were separated from crude platinum. It's a very dense metal, five times as heavy as aluminium. Chemically, it's extremely robust and stable. A noble metal, it resists attack from acid, unlike copper and other base metals which decompose readily. This realization led to one of the first industrial applications of platinum. It was used in face of fragile glass to line the vats in which sulfuric acid was manufactured. It is one of the few metals unaffected by atmospheric exposure and it remains untarnished even when heated. Most other metals, like copper, oxidize when subjected to the same treatment. The practical value of its long-lasting stability was quickly recognized by the French scientist Janetti, who, in 1795, selected platinum as the metal from which to make the standard kilogram weight. For the same reason, the standard meter length was also cast in platinum. And in 1834, it was adopted for the imperial standard measures in Great Britain. Early in the 19th century, Sir Humphrey Davy discovered the catalytic property of platinum, its ability to promote or accelerate certain chemical reactions without itself undergoing any material change, and used this property in the development of the miner's safety lamp. Michael Faraday, another distinguished scientist, demonstrated that platinum was an ideal container for melting glass. His experiments revolutionized the manufacture of high-quality optical glass. In its pure form, platinum was discovered to be malleable and easily worked, ideal for the manufacture of non-corrosive laboratory and medical equipment. Conveniently, in 1824, just as world demand for the metal started to grow, large deposits of platinum were discovered in the Ural Mountains of Russia, as well as satisfying most of the growing world demand, the Russian authorities used it as legal tender, producing exceptionally fine ruble coins, now priceless relics, rare even in museums and private collections. At the court of the Tsars, platinum jewellery began to be worn. The renowned artist craftsman Fabergé used it in some of his intricate and ornate pieces. Jewellery is a reflection of its time both in style and in the materials used. In the late 19th century, the discovery of diamonds in South Africa brought a new fashion. The colour, strength and durability of platinum made it the ideal medium for setting the precious stones. In the early 20th century, while the industrial demand for the metal was still limited, platinum jewellery enjoyed a great vogue. Much of the raw material came from Canada, where platinum was discovered as a byproduct of the nickel mines, which had gone into production in 1909. Today, the Sudbury mines in Ontario are still one of the world's major producers, but the rate of production depends on the demand for nickel. Russia, too, with her Ural deposits, 
and a new mining venture at Norelsk in the frozen Arctic remains a leading supplier. But the most important producer of platinum and platinum group metals is now Southern Africa, where the world's greatest known reserves are located. These deposits were discovered in 1924 by a brilliant geologist, Dr. Marensky, who gave his name to the rich platinum-bearing reef. It is part of the Bushveldt igneous complex, a unique geological formation in the Transvaal and Baputu Tswana areas of South Africa. Platinum is found in igneous rocks formed by the cooling and crystallization of liquids from deep within the crust or upper part of the mantle, known as magmas. Unlike these dramatic surface eruptions of lava, the Bushveldt deposits were formed deep underground when magma forced its way into the host rocks. The Marensky Reef is a segregation layer formed some 2,000 million years ago. Although only a few tens of centimeters thick, it is so rich that it can be mined for its platinoid content rather than the nickel and copper it also contains. The mines in the Rustenburg area stretch along a line for about 80 kilometers. They account for more than 80% of the free world's newly mined platinum. The seam dips away from the surface at about 9 degrees, and mining starts 50 meters below ground, continuing to a depth of about 1,000 meters. The techniques used are similar to those employed in the nearby gold mines of Johannesburg. The miners channel crosscuts to intercept the ore body, then establish stokes so that they can blast out the valuable payload. Once blasted, the rock is scraped mechanically into ore passes. Trains wind their way through a maze of tunnels, delivering the broken reef to the shaft so that it can be hauled up to the surface in a continuous round-the-clock operation. yet another railway system to collect the payload from the mines and deliver it to a central smelting complex. Despite the introduction of the most modern technology, mining costs are high. Each mine employs thousands of workers and requires an investment in machinery and equipment running into hundreds of millions. And the mining of the material is merely the first stage of the operation. every ounce of platinum recovered, 10 tons of rock have to be mined. The ore is first fed into giant silos, which regulate the supply of raw material to the tube mills. The rotating cylinders contain steel balls, which reduce the rock to a powder of very fine consistency. The next stage is to separate the mineral particles from the waste. This is achieved in a series of flotation chambers. Air is passed through the liquid slurry and chemicals added. This causes the valuable mineral particles to rise from the waste matter and adhere to the bubbles. As the mineral rich froth spills over, it is collected and pumped to the smelter plant. After dewatering and drying, Smelting takes place in electric furnaces. The sulfur gas, which is a byproduct of the smelting process, is collected and converted into sulfuric acid, a useful spin-off, as well as an effective way of protecting the environment by eliminating pollution.
the molten mat from the smelter is transferred to a converter where any remaining impurities are burnt off. The result? A cauldron containing a mixture of platinum group metals, nickel, copper, cobalt, gold and silver, ready for their final and extremely difficult separation. In this particular plant, the molten mat is poured into a high-pressure water jet, which granulates it for more convenient transportation to the refinery. Nickel, copper and cobalt are recovered by leaching before the material is subjected to the extremely complicated refining procedure, which involves about 150 different processes. The various stages of purification and flotation are continued with hydrometallurgy, pyrometallurgy and electro-winning, so it's no wonder that the process takes months before the valuable end products, including gold and silver, are finally recovered. This is platinum salt, ready for the final process, conversion to the metallic form. The other salts recovered include rhodium, which will be turned into the brightest of all the metals and one of the most expensive. Iridium, the heaviest metal known to man. Ruthenium, after iridium, the hardest metal in the group. And palladium, the lightest, extremely ductile and highly sought after as a catalyst. This is palladium at an intermediate stage between salt and pure metal. A metallic sponge which is fed into a furnace so that it can be cast into ingots or granulated for sale to industrial users. Pure platinum is cast into ingots and then rolled or drawn into a variety of shapes and sizes depending on the use to which it's to be put. Small bars are also produced to meet the demand from investors all over the world. A select few choose to wear their ingot well. Others prefer more conventional jewellery. Platinum has a high tensile strength so that thin and hollow wires have good shape retention, giving the artist a freedom of design not possible with other materials. Platinum is easily worked, and the design can be enhanced by the use of a variety of distinctive surface textures. Platinum jewellery is 95% pure. The remaining 5% is made up of other metals which give it the particular properties demanded by the jeweller. Today, there's an assured and regular supply of newly mined material, so platinum jewellery enjoys a new popularity, particularly in Japan, and more recently in Europe and America. Platinum is vital in many high-technology industries. Man-made materials like rayon and glass fiber could not be produced without the high-temperature, non-corrosive platinum bushings and spinnerets used to form the filaments which are basic to these synthetic materials. By passing an electrical current between the specially designed fins, this bushing can be made to reach furnace heat. Molten glass is fed directly into the trough and drawn through the minute holes freely and without contamination. Man-made fibers have taken the place of more conventional materials in all sorts of roles, from such humdrum everyday objects as the kitchen sink to the most sophisticated forms of transport. In the chemical industry, platinum plays an equally important role, both as a container for corrosive substances and as a catalyst in a variety of processes. For some applications, 
wire is woven into a fine mesh. In this form, it is used in the oxidation of ammonia to produce nitric acid, essential to the manufacture of both explosives and fertilizers. With an escalating world population, there is no more urgent or pressing need than the increased production of grain. For this, nitrate fertilizers are vital. A truly noble role for a precious metal. During the 1970s in the United States and in Japan, a new use for platinum as a catalyst was developed. Los Angeles and Tokyo are notorious for airborne smog and pollution, largely caused by motor car exhaust fumes. The only successful solution to the problem so far has been the catalytic converter. Platinum and palladium alloy introduced into the exhaust system, either in pellet form or as a honeycomb construction. Laboratory tests on all new models are carried out to ensure that all the dangerous gases, including carbon monoxide and methane, are converted to harmless carbon dioxide, nitrogen and water. Platinum, as a catalyst, is also playing a role in the direct conversion of chemical energy into electricity. The fuel cell was initially developed to generate power for spacecraft but large-scale land-based units are already in service. They use a platinum catalyst to promote the direct change of naphtha, a distillate of coal tar, into electricity. In this electrochemical process, the chemical energy that bonds atoms of hydrogen to oxygen from the atmosphere is converted into electrical energy in an anode, electrolyte and cathode sandwich. Small-scale, independent fuel cells running on this principle are ideal for on-site generation of power in large buildings, remote towns and in developing countries. In this electronic age, the platinum group metals are prized for their reliability and durability. They're used in everything electronic, from word processors and industrial robots to trivial television games. The microelectronic industry could not function without platinum group metals. And in medicine, platinum is a lifesaver. The pacemaker must provide an unfailing electrical pulse of up to 70 times a minute to keep the patient's heart beating. The circular electrode is in direct contact with living tissue, but remains undamaged by the highly corrosive body fluids. Platinum has proved a lifesaver in yet another field of medicine. This is the manufacture in the United States of an anti-cancer drug, which may prove highly significant in the fight against the disease. It was the first metal anti-cancer drug to be produced, and represents the latest contribution by platinum to human well-being. In aviation, safety and reliability are prime concerns, and only the best materials can even be considered. Vital parts of jet engines are coated with platinum alloys to protect them from heat and the corrosive effects of the fuel. Highly sophisticated navigation and avionic systems controlling today's giants of the air provide yet another example of a situation in which failure on the part of key components cannot be tolerated. Yet another area where only the best will do. And the best in this field, as in so many others, is that noble metal so long prized by the rich and discerning. Platinum, the element PT.